Um, so, um, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I think we're on the, the final phase. Um, Kieran referred to the final phase of the conference, but I suppose for me, we're, I would hope, kind of on a final phase, perhaps too, within, within climate change itself. So, as Kieran alluded to, I've been in this area for quite a long time, um, maybe longer than I like to think about, but um, I suppose what I've seen over the past 15 years or so is that the climate change debate has gone through a series of phases. We've gone from the early days of the development and the consolidation around the science itself, um, to the development of policy, um, to the development of plans and uh, projects uh, such as uh, the local authority work and sectoral work, and right up to where we are right now, which I think is we are entering and have actually begun this very final phase, which to me is perhaps the most important phase, and that is the phase where we need to bring all of society with us. So this has been alluded to, I think, this morning through all the other presentations, everybody in the different, uh, I suppose, sectoral breakdowns in whether it's agriculture or transport or energy, as we've just said, have all alluded to that kind of societal element. This, as I said, is the most challenging, and it is something that I think is, um, it's very opportune right now that we should take that energy that's in that space right now and actually try and work with that and guide that. There's a window of opportunity open right now, I do think, but if we lose that or abuse that, we will probably have lost the transition, I would think, at least in the short, ter short term. So what I'm going to speak about today is this notion of a societal transformation, what it could look like. And I think what I want to try and bring my kind of thesis here is that we need to have some kind of mechanism that harnesses that energy that's there within communities and different networks and try and help to mold that to take the debate forward in a kind of a managed and planned way. Just as we see that there is management and a planning going on around the other sectoral transitions that are occurring, I do believe that we need to do the same thing with the societal element, and that is exceptionally challenging. So as I said, what I will talk about today is that transition, uh, the societal element, how we might manage that process, and then just a couple of solutions. So where are we? So in my slide here, um, I think this has been alluded to, by practically every, <laughs> every slide that came forward today. So I won't bore you to death with, with the context. But suffice to say that there, we are at one degree uh, temperature above pre-industrial levels. We understand the causes and we understand the implications. We see the global implications and we see them for Ireland. It's writ large. The policy context, that's also quite clear. We have the Paris Agreement and that sets out the global uh, goal that we have to keep temperature below 2 degrees Celsius and try and limit that to 1.5. That is our target. The IPCC then sets out how we try to go and achieve that, and what we're really looking for here is net zero carbon by 2050, if we are to hit that 1.5 degree target. So this is extremely challenging. So how do we do this? Hoping this will work. Uh -huh. So I think in systems, and I think it's probably a good way to make some kind of sense of what it is we are challenged with. So I believe that what, to achieve what we're trying to do, we need to have this systems transition. However you slice or dice a, a, a system, because there are many ways of, of, of doing this, I do believe there are a few core points with any system. First off, all systems are interlinked to each other. So this means our thinking has to be very much joined up because systems are inherently interlinked and joined to each other. The other thing is that systems, basically, if you make change in one area, there's a quite a strong possibility that change will be felt elsewhere. And by the same token, if you hit barriers or obstacles in one part of a system, they too will become manifest later on in another part of the system. So I think actually the presentations that went previous, and particularly Mary's one, there was a good allusion to this idea of barriers that are there within the systems. And there are many barriers we see across all the systems. But the problem where they occur within one particular, let's say, sector of a part of a system, that then is manifest later on and often at the cold face where people exist and it is there that systems blockage occurs. Systems then, if we're talking about systems transitions, we have to think about the underlying processes that sit within them. So systems aren't flat like this scheme, the schema uh, would suggest. They're multi-layered and multi-dimensional. So within that, there is this enabling environment or enabling context 
where we see um, processes such as technologies, institutions, governance, um, different infrastructures, and behavioral change. So actually when you, I suppose, unravel down what it is that we need to change, it is actually within each of those layers that we need to make our changes if we have to have, or if we're trying to get this wide systems change. What this also applies, of course, is that this occurs across layers and spheres, and that implies that to bring about the transition, we need to bring in layers and different types of players and different actors. So it really opens up the space to understand that this is a process that has to be taken forward by both government, um, markets, and also pe me, people on the ground. So that makes it extremely complex. The societal challenge or the societal transition is part of a wider transition, and as, as I said, and as we've seen earlier on today, the systems other transitions have begun. So they have begun and are moving forward, and some, I suppose, there's more <laughs> penetration in some areas than in others. But the societal challenge or the societal transition, I would suggest, has also begun. But to try and take some kind of control and shape on this, we need to really think forward how we would manage that. And as has been alluded to quite earlier and a lot today, is that there's a lot of activity on the ground. This is actually a very busy space right now. So for, I suppose, a lot of us in this room that might be you know, living and working in, in bubbles, we need to step outside that and actually get a look and see what's going on in wider society. There's a huge amount of activity. There's a lot of amount of, we know the schools activity, but there's a lot of NGO activity. There are a lot of people in their homes and communities trying to do something. So how do we actually try and make some sense out of that? So how do we manage this societal transformation? We know that to manage any kind of a society or any kind of a transition, we need some kind of a vision. We need a direction of travel. And Tara quite nicely alluded to this earlier on as well. So with this, we actually are quite lucky in that the UNFCCC and the IPCC have set out for us a vision of what the roadmaps could be and what we need to achieve. We're seeing at the moment the CAROs and the local authorities and the sectors are developing their adaptation strategies. And within them, of course, there will be a vision as to how they would see their sector or how they would see their locality moving forward and taking some of that um, wider vision. I still would suggest that there is more work require, required in this area. People on the ground would really need to see, well, what will Ireland look like in 2050? What does that mean for my community, my home? What does it mean for how my kids will go to school or go to college? What does it mean for how we will feed ourselves, um, how we will heat our homes, and so on and so forth? So there is a piece of work that is required there. So for any kind of a process that you're setting up and planning for, you then need to have these actions. So these actions are well known. So we need to have changes within our educational system. This was alluded to very early in the morning. Actually, Ed mentioned it. We need to have uh, changes around how we train people. And I know the local authorities are interested in, 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 in moving forward on that. And changes around how we raise awareness and who we engage with. Ed also referred to this in the morning. So we can't forget that that piece of work also still has to be ongoing. If you looked at the polls right now, they're suggesting that there's a huge wave of awareness around climate change in Ireland, and I, and I accept that. But I still hear, even particularly people that are looking at, let's say, what candidates for the elections are hearing on the doorstep. And I was quite surprised to hear over the last few days that people are not hearing a whole pile about climate change. So there are different things going on right now. Polls are telling us one thing, can people that are meeting candidates or meeting um, election candidates on the door are saying, actually, climate isn't on the agenda at all. So we have to be cognizant that we're not, again, as I said, in this bubble, just listening to ourselves and hearing our own echo back. We have to be aware that there is still a big tranche of society that are not up to speed on this, are not able to take on board this kind of messaging because there are other issues out there, as Tara alluded to. You know, people are worried about their homes and people are worried about getting their kids to school and climate change may not be up there with that for, for them right now. So we have to be aware when we move forward with any kind of a program, we have to keep that element in it as well. So what, then are, what else is available to us apart from, you know, education and training? Um, a behavioural change is, of course, a huge element of this. And we know our colleagues in the SEAI are doing a huge amount of Trojan work in this. And I would see this as something that we... Um, as an institution, have all got to be engaged in as well. We do know that there are shifts in behaviour occurring, 
But I would suggest that they're not nearly good enough. So uh, again, we mentioned about the, I suppose, um, topics such as plastic bags that are um, ways that open routes and to discussions around climate change. But at the end of the day, single-use plastics, that is very much this idea of tinkering at the edges. If we're talking about systems change, we are talking about huge changes across everything. And while every action does, of course, count, it is actually we do need to ratchet this up. And I think for a country such as Ireland, where we have a really high carbon footprint, and if you haven't used our, our little carbon calculator outside the door, have a look at it. And even on that, put in your own information, and you will probably be shocked. I even was shocked for myself. I was like, oh my god, I have so much to do when I go home uh, this evening. Uh, well, maybe tomorrow morning. Um, but the thing is, we, are, we have a high carbon footprint, and we, as individuals, of course, then are faced with a massive challenge that may not be the case in less developed countries. So that is part of the issue here. What is it that we need to do right now? So if we put a plan in place and that's what we're going to do, how do we actually manage that process? Now, as I said, this is a very busy space right now. There are a lot of actors in the, in the space doing fantastic work. I have to say there are people doing great work and I would refer to colleagues like SEAI. I would refer to colleagues here on the, on the, on the um, panel our um, PPNs, um, the local authorities, the CAROs, they're all part of the mix. But I would suggest that we need to actually find some mechanism, some governance or institutional mechanism that can bring all of that energy together, bring the top layers and the bottom layers together and put a shape around that. And of course, I, you're going to say she would say this, but I'm going to suggest that the national dialogue could be one of those mechanisms. Now, you might have other preferences, but for now, just, uh, I will just talk about the National Dialogue. So we mentioned this earlier on today, and I'm sure there are people in the room that have probably no idea what I'm talking about. Well, the first thing, is, I suppose, is that the conference itself is coming in under the banner of the dialogue. So I'll just let you know what, what the dialogue is. So the dialogue is an initiative of the Government of Ireland, and it's a process to, I suppose, begin and to progress on this idea of widespread uh, societal engagement on the topic of climate change. The idea is over time it would support our national transition objective and that it would also be supportive of the delivery of the um, all of government plan. So that is it in a kind of a nutshell. So where we position ourselves is within this idea of a spectrum of engagement. So for any of you that are familiar with that kind of literature, there is a spectrum, it's like a five-step process um, of how you engage uh, communities from pre-awareness, to mobilizing people, to getting people to the table, getting people to act, and finally empowering people. So there are a series of steps there. So we would place the dialogue as firmly within a couple of those steps. So within that, we have three key objectives, and they are to create awareness, um, understanding and engagement, motivate action and enable people to become involved, and thirdly, to empower conversation on climate action and inform um, policy uh, support. Um, these are actually, I think, interchangeable, and it isn't the case of you just go through one and you move on and that's the end of it. I think these things occur simultaneously and in different communities. So it isn't the case of that you just go in and do one, your job is done, you move to the next step, that's it, the dialogue is over, we don't need to do any more. It is a fact that, as I said, people are on a different spectrum across different communities, so it has to be a multi-layered, um, multi-pronged approach to this. Okay, I seem to have kind of lost the slide there. Okay, no, I haven't. So, what have we done? So, what we have done today is we've held a series of, of events, and I just, I suppose, bring your attention to two quite large regional events that we've had to try and trial this process and try and figure out what are the, I suppose, the best approaches and what we needed to learn. So, last year in June, and uh, we followed up with a, in, in, with a meeting in or an event in Athlone, and we followed up with a second uh, large scale event in Tralee in November 2018. And at these events, there were, and I think they were mentioned earlier on this morning, is, you know, there were, there were high caliber events, there were high energy events. We had a lot of people in, in the room that we had made a lot of effort to get into the room. We had the minister at the first meeting. Uh, we had a lot of officials there. We had a very good mix of people from different communities. We had the PPNs there. We had people from business in the communities. We had um, our uh, friends from the IFA. We had, as I said, a mix of everybody in the room. So what we did was we tried to cover a lot of things. We tried to look at the awareness raising piece. We tried to get people motivated to do stuff, get them 
to sign up to things and to try and figure out what was of interest. So that determined the type of approach we took. So our first piece would have been like a mini little conference. We had signs in, so the people who had an idea of what was happening, what the implications were for Ireland and what we could expect. We did um, workshop people. So any of you that run a workshop to try and run a workshop with 200 people is not easy, but we, we attempted it and we got a, got a lot of good information on it. We had a lot of questions and answers. You see, we have panel sessions here. And then we also had this idea of drop-in zones, which had been similar to this setup up we had upstairs on the foyer, where we brought a lot of, I suppose, players together and people could interact and find out what was going on in different communities and what different offerings were out there. So they were really, really good, but they were a, a snapshot in time, I would think. But they set the bar for us as to what we should be looking at. So I suppose the key thing is what did we learn here? So what we learned were, I think, um, things you would kind of expect. So from that point of view, it wasn't earth shattering, but it was informative and I suppose has, has really framed our thinking. What we found out was that a lot of people were aware. Okay, but what people really wanted to know was, what do we do next? We're aware, we're ready for action. What have you got? What can we do? And this has also been reflected very much in the Irish Times uh, opinion piece that are uh, the behavior and attitude poll that came out about two weeks ago, where it said that 80% of the Irish population were aware of climate change, but frankly did not know what to do. So our, um, our two events last year were telling us exactly the same thing. So obviously things have to move on in, in the least bit. People are very keen to make a difference. So people really wanted to get stuck in, but what we're picking up is that there's a huge amount of frustration out there. People, you know, are willing, they want you to say, give me something, I will do it, but please make it easy and I will do it for you now straight away. But don't put it on the never, never and try and remove all those barriers. The other thing that we found was that people want to work in communities. People want to work with their, their neighbours, they want to work with their communities and they're very keen on doing that. They also want to work on within existing networks. It was made blatantly clear to us, people did not want us to go developing more networks. There are oodles of them around the country. So what people want to do was to work within their own communities with their own networks. So by that, I mean communities such as our networks, such as PPNs, people might be involved in tidy towns, transition towns, they might be involved in energy communities, or they could be involved in the local IFA, the local um, men's shed, um, you name it, people just wanted to get involved with their own groups doing their own work. They also would see that they wanted some way of being able to interface with and have some way of speaking with decision makers, which we thought was kind of interesting. So they would have seen that the dialogue was something that could offer them this, so that when the tough or when the new policy came out, let's say, you know, to something in relation to carbon tax, Alan might might like to hear this, but people were interested in, in having those kind of conversations to see how that could be unraveled. What does that mean for me, you know, on the ground? And what are the benefits of, of we going down these routes? They, we, they wanted us to enable connections and to work collaboratively. So I suppose that was the key thing, was to work collaboratively. People wanted to work with people they didn't normally work with. So we've done some other sh workshopping and we have found that people are very keen when they're allowed to speak to each other in what I would see as a non-confrontational, this idea of a safe space, that people can and will get into bed with each other and do that work together, which I found was interesting. And they would see that the dialogue could create that kind of non-confrontational, easy space to work with. People are also interested in listening to you and speaking to you when you speak to their interests. And Ed spoke about this this morning. So what the key learning point is, when you are, and, and so did Tara actually mentioned this, people want their interests and their values reflected in, in how you approach them. So if you're going in speaking to, let's say, an agricultural community, well, their interests, of course, are within that. You don't go speaking to them about polar bears or anything else. Or people that are suffering from fuel poverty, you go in and speak about issues that are relevant to them. The background issue might be climate, but you go in and frame your messaging according to what people's real interests are in society. The other thing is that we discovered is there are many communities, there are many different type of communities. So when we speak of community, you normally might think it's, you know, the men's shed or, you know, the local ICA group. But really, there are communities of many hues and shapes. There are communities of practice, there are business communities, there are 
youth communities. So it is not just one community. There are many types of communities that form part of those sectors that we mentioned earlier on, which then means that something like the dialogue has not only to be able to move out laterally, but it also has to have those upward conversations with those other communities above. And then, of course, there was that piece of how do we access the people that are unengaged, the people that we don't normally get to? Because, as I said, I do believe there's still a large tranche of society that haven't actually, we haven't actually managed to get them into the room. The upshot of all of this, of course, is that it's all about the local. And so for those of you from the social sciences side of that are working this for the last 20 years, you're kind of saying, did it take her 15 minutes to get to that? Well, do you know what? It did. Uh, but anyway, here we are. So what I'm saying is, what are our next steps? So our next steps, I think, would be to actually address that, um, that local piece and to think through it properly in a kind of a structured approach. There are many methods within this and how we could do it, and they all have a different reach, and they all have a different implication, and they do different things, and they hit different parts of audiences that are on this journey. But what the interesting thing is that we're, right now we're thinking through how we would actually pilot a local, uh, um, I suppose, a local piece of activity. And the idea here is that we would actually work with a community, work the, with the businesses in that community, the tidy towns, the youth groups, the different groups there. And we've started to do this, and the idea is we'd come together, develop projects, and help them to work through those over a period of time to develop legacy, and then roll that out throughout the country over a period of time, and eventually pass that on to other people that can take that forward. And I would suggest that one group that is probably really well capable of, of helping to put sustainability around this would actually be the, the local authorities who have a very long reach um, into communities um, at the end of the day. The other piece is this public deliberation piece. And I think this was mentioned by Brian in his uh, section earlier on. There are still a lot of hard conversations to be had around all sections of the different sectoral transitions that are occurring. And those conversations need to be had. And just, I suppose, harping back to the, the tradition that we're starting to build up here in this country of deliberative democracy, starting with the Citizens' Assembly up to the Giant Eroctus uh, Committee report, I think we're in a good position to trial maybe smaller processes around this. And I know some of our uh, EPF-funded research is looking at this as well. And this is something that we would consider doing ourselves. So have we got form here? And you're probably wondering, what the hell? You know what, I suggest we actually do have form here. And I know people mentioned earlier about different campaigns that we've run in the past and in the very immediate past that have been highly successful. And they have, of course, thinking back in the last year or two, what is the marriage equality or the uh, abortion referendum, we've been extremely successful. But I've got another um, example, and I know this has been bandied around in the media a little bit recently in, in conjunction with something else, a different topic, but um, I think I got there first. So I'm going to refer to the rural electrification scheme that ran from 1945 to 1975. And this has a lot of similarities with what we're trying to do um, with the transition. This was a massive transformation that occurred within rural Ireland within a relatively short period of time. The thing here was this was extremely difficult in that a new technology was being introduced to a country at a period of time in which it was poor, conservative, and I would say possibly hungry. You now had to go to communities and convince them to buy this technology from you you're going to charge them for it, and you're also going to charge them for every piece of equipment that they required, whether it was a cooker, um, you know, a washing machine, um, a fridge, whatever you were having yourself. But you had to convince them to buy all of that as well. And as I said, that was a big, tall order in 1945. Maybe not so tall in 1975. But I think when this scheme was being run out, they did two really clever things. First off, they put a structure in place. Uh, they put an institutional structure in place that put communities of action in every parish in the country. So they put staff actually in every parish who worked very closely with existing networks that were within those parishes. So they worked with the ICA, Makrana Pharma, Makrana Tuha, um, the IFA, and so on over a period of time. And they used early, um, I suppose, key influencers, as we'd refer to them now, but they were key messengers back in the day, people that had a long reach into households, and they worked with those. They also did another, a lot of other interesting things. They held these events, 
And these were like really big events. So you had this switching on ceremony, and you can see here in this one, this image over here on the left, the great to go to the parish rock up, everybody's there. Um, and there's a lot of interesting stories about these uh, outings. They, also, as I said, you use the voluntary uh, organizations. And here you can see um, there's a lady baking a cake, even though I don't know why a nurse would bake cakes. But anyhow, it probably really isn't a nurse. It's just a hygiene thing, I would say. So, but this was the thing. Um, we used the volunteers, and that was extremely successful. And then they had these big demonstration things where they um, you know, brought people along to see the washing machine working and the cooker working, so on and so forth. Now, the other interesting thing that they did with this was they put a lot of effort into getting the messaging right. So this, again, was pre-social media. So what they did was here, they focused in on three specific communities. They went after the agricultural community. Uh, clearly, this was to do with uh, the, rural, um, the rural society. But they basically said to agriculture, you know, agriculture at this stage, I suppose, was... Um, it was very basic, and if you were to modernize Irish agriculture, you needed electricity. You needed to have running water, and you needed electricity in your milking parlor if you were to move beyond one or two cows and actually move things forward. So that was the messaging for agriculture. The messaging for the rural society as a whole was, Ireland was dark and dreary, I would, I would guess, in 1945. But if you could open it up, switch on a light, you could have open up your, your, your local hall, you could have cinema, you could have things happening. It basically took the drudgery out of, out of basic, I would say, dull, empty country life. The third, and I would think the, probably the most influential group that they went after, were housewives, women in the home. And what their basic attitude was here, and I love this quote, this was by James Dillon, who was the Minister for Agriculture in 1915. He was really, I suppose, he was, he was on the bottom with this. Young ladies, let it be known, there will be no more marriages until there's hot and cold water on tap in the kitchen. Now, I think this was really instrumental because what he did here was he had teamed up with the ICA, and this quote came from some big exhibition that they were running in the RDS in 1950, and this was his take-home message. So I don't have anything as cool and as catchy as that, but I do think we do need some kind of key messaging in all of this. And I think for ourselves, to think through that messaging piece and that communications piece is equally as important. So we need to help, um, we need to have the right messaging going to communities. We need to have it very, um, I suppose, streamlined to the communities that we're reaching in, into. So for example, research from the UK, recent research has shown um, that if they're going after, let's say, um, a very conservative Tory uh, community, they have a very specific uh, focus on that. And if you think back, what are the values that underpin that type of society? Well, they're very traditional. They want the status quo. They want things to stay the same. Now, we know climate change is going to change that. So how then do you help them to understand, well, if your actions are doing this, it's upsetting the things that are really of value to you. And that's the type of approach that they take in their communications to that very conservative uh, part of society. I would say there's another communications piece here, and Tara alluded to it earlier on, and something that we should not forget around this whole climate change debate is that a lot of effort and time has gone into speaking about the emission side of it. But there is that whole other side on the, my time's up, um, on risk and vulnerability. And within this, we do need to have those conversations about who's vulnerable, but also what they're vulnerable to and what the risks are coming down along the line. And this is where I would suggest that the science is exceptionally important. The science has to be kept going, but the science has also got to be communicated, not only to society, but it also has to be, I suppose, suppose made palatable and usable for our sectors and local authorities that are working on developing their strategies. So we've seen this already today. So gosh, there's nothing new coming out of this. Um, I suppose my final um, thought on all of this is that the transition has occurred and is, be is beginning, it's on its way. And we know that the transition across energy and transport and agriculture, they have a plan and they have, um, I suppose, a methodology on how they're going to move forward with all of this. And that is absolutely right. I would suggest that the societal element, which is, I would say, an equal partner in all of this, has to have the same emphasis. It too needs to be planned for, and it too needs to be managed, or I would suggest that this transition will be lost. That window of opportunity is open. It's wide open right now, but unless we push through it collectively and work together, I'm afraid this won't go the way we'd hope it would. No, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>